can't sleep? Don't want to sleep? Afraid to sleep? Are the windows closed? Are your doors locked? Did you check your closet? And under your bed? Maybe you should keep a light on in the hallway, just in case. Now settle in. Make yourself comfortable. Lay back. Close your eyes. And let me tell you a story. Can't sleep? Don't want to sleep? Afraid to sleep? Are the windows closed? Are your doors locked? Did you check your closet? And under your bed? Maybe you should keep a light on in the hallway, just in case. Now settle in. Make yourself comfortable. Lay back. Close your eyes. And let me tell you a story. Have you ever wished you had just a little more time? Or perhaps the ability to go back in time, just a bit, to fix something you did wrong? Make a different decision about which line to get in at the grocery store. Or whether or not to eat that leftover bagel at work. Meet Edward, the perfect example of the absent-minded professor, whose brilliance as a theoretical physicist can unlock the secrets of time and space, but the simple act of getting ready for his nephew's birthday party becomes a challenge of epic proportions. The Time Traveler's Dilemma Edward, we have to go. We're going to be late, Joan shouted from upstairs. Edward looked at his watch. Time. Why did there never seem to be enough of it? Well, that would change soon enough. He glanced down at the device on his workbench. It looked so unassuming, but if he could work out the final kinks, it would revolutionize the world, hopefully for the better. Edward turned off the lights in his basement workshop and climbed the wooden stairs up to the kitchen where Joan was waiting, her arms crossed. She looked at Edward and raised an eyebrow, just enough to inform him that he had done something to disappoint her. What? he asked, checking his shirt for mustard stains and making sure his socks matched. Where is the gift? Joan asked. The gift? Eric's gift, your nephew's birthday present. You did wrap it, didn't you? Yes, yes, of course, Edward assured her. He could distinctly remember enclosing the electronics kit in colorful paper and even placing a bow on it. A purple bow, Eric's favorite color. Or was it Joan's favorite color? So, where is it? Joan asked. Edward looked at the counter near the back door, expecting to see it there. It was the most logical place to leave it, right where he would see it before they went into the garage. It wasn't there. He checked the kitchen table, the spot where he had done the wrapping, but it wasn't there either. Joan tapped her foot. It's around here someplace, he insisted. I distinctly remember wrapping it. Do you? Or do you remember thinking about wrapping it? No, no, I definitely wrapped it, he said, feeling the small paper cut on his thumb he had incurred from the edge of the gift wrap. He tried to reassemble the events of that morning in his mind. Ah, he exclaimed. I must have left it in the closet when I put the gift wrapping supplies away. Joan shook her head pulled out her phone and started flipping through her messages. Edward exited the kitchen and walked over to the small triangular closet under the stairs where they kept the tubes of wrapping paper, ribbons, and bows, along with other holiday decorations and supplies. He opened the door, stuck his head inside, and stared at the contents. He saw the wrapping paper, the box containing tape, scissors, and various gift tags. He saw the Christmas lights, the various holiday centerpieces that decorated the kitchen table during specific seasons, even the little leprechaun that for some reason absolutely terrified him. But there was no gift. He looked around the living room, checking every surface, even behind the sofa, trying to retrace every conceivable step he could have taken that morning after he had wrapped the present. Edward, Joan chimed from the kitchen, 
We're now officially late. Edward returned to the kitchen and started looking in all the cabinets. Why would you have put it in the cabinet? Joan asked. I don't know, but it's not anywhere else. Where else have you been today? Nowhere. I haven't left the house. Joan raised that eyebrow again. Of course. He must have taken it down to his workshop. I'll be right back, Edward said as he disappeared down the steps. He flipped the lights back on and glanced around the cluttered workshop, hoping to spot the bright purple bow among the various devices and equipment that filled the numerous shelves and his workbench. It wasn't there. Where did he put it? Edward started looking into boxes, among piles of tangled wires, under the stairs. Then he spotted the device he had been working on moments before. His time machine. Of course. Why didn't he think of it earlier? All he needed to do was go back in time to that morning and watch to see what he did with the present. Only, that was the one thing that was still wrong with it. According to his calculations, it was only capable of sending him back 9 minutes and 55 seconds. But maybe that would be enough to search for the present and find it before Joan decided to leave without him. Edward turned on the machine and it hummed to life. The lights dimmed as it charged the temporal capacitor. He made sure he was standing in the spot where the displacement field would be generated and flipped the switch. Edward, what are you? Joan's question was cut off mid-sentence. Edward looked at his watch, then at the wall clock above his workbench. They were almost ten minutes apart. It worked. The lights went out. Edward looked to the foot of the stairs where the switch was, and he saw himself climbing the stairs as he had done ten minutes earlier. So, now all he had to do was search the basement, find the gift, put it someplace his earlier self would find it, and then... Then what? What would happen to him? If he was able to find the present, and his earlier self had needed to use the time machine, then he shouldn't be here right now. It would create a paradox. Joan had warned him about just such a pitfall when he had told her he was working on a time machine, but he hadn't paid her much attention. He was a theoretical physicist, after all. Yet, here he was. Maybe she was right. He couldn't worry about that now. He needed to find that gift. He raced over to the stairs, made sure he wasn't looking at himself, then turned the lights back on. Where was it? What had he worked on besides the time machine and the hours between wrapping the present and when Joan had called him to go to the party? He had unpacked a shipment of spare parts. Where had he put that box? Ah, over there, next to the wormhole generator. Edward thrust his arms into the white styrofoam peanuts and felt around, hoping his hands would discover the present buried deep in the midst of the packing material. But he came up empty. What else? He had spent some time polishing a new mirror for his telescope. Had he put it on top of the polisher? Had it fallen behind the device while it was spinning away? Edward searched the area around the machine, but nowhere was there a carefully wrapped up box with a purple bow on it. He heard footsteps upstairs, then himself telling Joan, I'll be right back. He raced to turn off the lights, then hurried over to the far end of the workshop where he hid himself in a tall, empty cabinet. His earlier self rushed down the steps. Edward felt something in the dark at his feet. Was it a box? He pulled out his keychain where he had a tiny flashlight attached among the half-dozen keys he carried. He twisted it to turn it on and shone it at the ground. It was a box, but not one wrapped in blue paper with colorful balloons printed on it and a purple bow on top. It was a shoebox. He kicked off the lid and saw it was filled with batteries of various sizes and voltages. That's where those went, he whispered to himself. Then he heard the distinctive hum of the time machine turn on. Edward looked at his watch. It had been nearly ten minutes. His earlier self was about to send himself back in time. He opened the cabinet just in time to hear Joan shout down the stairs. Edward, what are you doing down there? As his earlier self vanished, sliding back in time nine minutes and fifty-five seconds. He wondered if he would snap out of existence since his past self had altered his future. But nothing happened. What are you doing in there? A voice asked him. His voice. Edward looked over toward the space under the stairs and saw himself hiding there. Wait a minute, what are you doing there? I'm hiding from my earlier self so I don't create a paradox. That's what I'm doing. The first Edward realized their mistake before the second one did. Of course, when I didn't find the present the second time, I sent myself back again. You already went back in time to find the present? 
Yes, I was hoping finding the past present in the present would obviate my need to travel back in time and my existence would be negated. And you would vanish. Right. At the very least, making that choice should have created a new quantum reality. Well, but you made that choice in this reality's past, not my future. Ah, yes, I see what you're saying. What who's saying? A third voice asked. The first two Edwards looked over and saw a third iteration of themselves emerge from behind the rack where his computer equipment was mounted. When did you get here? About ten minutes ago. Darn, I keep doing the same thing. We have to put a stop to this. But how? The time machine only goes back nine minutes and fifty-five seconds. We can't go back before we use it to warn us not to. No, but we can go back enough to tell the next version of ourselves to not waste time searching the basement. I think we can all agree it's not down here. Yes. yes. The other two Edwards agreed. But which one of us should go back? All of us. We need to break the cycle before more of us end up down here. Too late, the fourth Edward said. They all raced to the time machine. The first one there turned it on, and they all squeezed into the two-foot square spot that denoted the displacement zone. Wait for me, a fifth Edward shouted as he rushed to join the other four in the small area before the vortex shifted them back in time. The clock above the workbench showed it was a minute past the time they had originally traveled back to. What next? asked Edward. We need to search the rest of the house, Edward answered. Without our earlier selves seeing us, warned Edward. Of course, that goes without saying, Edward remarked. Okay, I'll take the bedroom. I'll check the guest room. I'll do the upstairs bathroom. I'll check Joan's office. I guess I'll search the attic. Why the attic? We haven't been up there in years. It's the only other place in the house to look. Edward told his other skeptical selves. They considered his logic and nodded in agreement. Okay, we have to get upstairs while we're not looking, Edward warned. And somehow get past Joan, he added. We need a distraction. No, we don't. When we go into the living room to check the Harry Potter closet, Joan starts playing around on her phone. That's right. And while we're sticking our head in that little closet, we should be able to get upstairs without Joan or ourselves seeing us. Okay, let's go. The five Edwards sneaked up the stairs. The first one saw that Joan's attention was indeed focused on her phone. He motioned to the others and they tiptoed through the kitchen, passed themselves digging through the contents of the holiday closet, and moved as quickly and quietly as they could up the stairs. They made it without being detected by the earlier Edward or Joan. Okay, Edward whispered to himself. We have to do this quickly. When we find it, we just have to give it to ourselves, and we should all disappear since we won't have a need to use the time machine in the first place. They all nodded in agreement. It's not up here, another Edward said. The original quintet of Edwards looked down the upstairs hallway and saw the new Edward emerging from the bedroom. Others emerged from the rest of the rooms and the door to the attic. Did you check Joan's shoe closet? Yes, that was the first place I looked. Under the bed? In the bathtub? In the chest in Joan's office? Yes, yes a chorus of Edwards replied. It has to be somewhere, Edward sighed in frustration. Obviously, it's not like it fell through a wormhole, he suggested offhandedly. The Edwards considered the possibility, but no, that was ridiculous. The wormhole generator in the basement was not even close to working. Oh, for crying out loud, Edward said from the stairs. Another group of themselves was sneaking up the steps. Now what? one of them asked. Well, I think the first thing one of us has to do is go back in time to keep any more of us from going back in time again. Right, right, right. I'll, I'll do, do it. it, four of the Edwards volunteered. Okay, okay you, do, you it. do it, they all said in unison. Shh, three of them hushed. They'll hear us. All of the Edwards became silent. Six of them checked their watches. We're, We're running, running out of time, time, they warned. Edward, Joan shouted from the kitchen. Uh-oh, fifteen Edwards groaned. Uh-oh the earlier Edward said from downstairs. Uh-oh, uh -oh. five more Edwards added. They crept down the stairs and peeked at what was happening in the kitchen. Another group of Edwards was gathered at the top of the stairs to the basement, while earlier Edwards stood speechless at the doorway between the kitchen and the living room. What's going on? Joan asked. You haven't been cloning yourself, have you? No, not at all, earlier Edward replied vehemently. Then he looked at his future selves. Right? he asked. Right, right, they replied. One of them stepped forward. It's not anything bad, he tried to assure Joan. Really, she asked. Can you explain to me just how? She did a quick head count of the Edwards on the basement steps. Five more of you is a good thing. We can get the garage painted in half a day, 
one of them offered. Joan's raised eyebrow glare silenced any other potential replies. Can one of you please explain why any of you exist? None of them spoke. Then they looked at each other using hand signals to negotiate which one of them would be the spokes-Edward for the group. After the unproductive charade went on for a few seconds, Joan interrupted. Okay, stop. You, she said, pointing to the Edward closest to her. Speak. Close Edward swallowed nervously. Well, I, we, were looking for Eric's gift in the basement, and it occurred to me, us, that if I, we, went back in time a few minutes, we'd have more time to look. But then I, we, didn't find it, and then our past self, him, he said, pointing to earlier Edward, came down, and I, we... Okay, Joan interrupted. Just use the first person. I get that there are more than one of you. Right, sorry. Anyway, I decided we, I mean, I, should go back in time again to look somewhere else before he... Close Edward pointed to his earlier self again. Came down and decided to go back in time again. I never went back in time in the first place. No, not yet, but you will in my past. And what about the rest of you? Joan asked. The other Edward started speaking all at once. Joan held up a hand and they all fell silent. Never mind. I think I have a good idea what happened next. And I believe I warned you about just such a thing. The Edwards bowed their heads. Anyway, we figure it must be upstairs somewhere since all of us searched the entire basement. One of the upstairs Edwards, listening on the steps to the second floor, leaned over to hear a bit better, but his weight caused a shift in the collective mass of the fifteen Edwards squeezed onto the staircase, and they all came tumbling noisily down to the foyer. Joan and the kitchen Edwards turned their attention to the living room, where the Edwards were untangling themselves. Oh dear, can this get any worse? she asked. From the pile of Edwards, one of them managed to get to his feet and wave meekly at Joan and his past and future selves. It's not upstairs, he said. What's not upstairs? earlier Edward asked. The present. Oh, right. Did you check inside the chest in Joan's, Joan's office? office? Six Edwards finished. It's, it's not there. Out there. Forget about the present, Joan said. We'll pick up a gift card on the way over. The bigger question is, what am I going to do with all of you? Well, we should all disappear once I decide not to use a time machine, earlier Edward said. He turned to his future selves. I assume I haven't been able to go back more than nine minutes and fifty-five seconds. That's, That's right, right, Twenty Edwards answered. Fine, Joan said in frustration. So how long do we have before you all pop off? Close Edward checked his watch. According to my calculations, we have about three minutes and twenty-four seconds. We can keep looking while we wait, one of the upstairs Edwards suggested. All the Edwards looked to Joan. Fine, go ahead, knock yourselves out, she said, then sat down at the kitchen table while twenty-one copies of her absent-minded husband milled about searching for the missing gift. They rechecked the kitchen cabinets, the closets, even under the sofa cushions. She heard a dozen of them stopping around upstairs, moving furniture, opening and closing doors. Three minutes later, they were still frantically searching. And a minute after that, it was apparent that none of them had ceased to exist. Joan glared at the nearest Edward with a raised eyebrow. He checked his watch, then got the attention of his other selves. Hey guys, there's something wrong. We're all still here. The search stopped. That's odd, Edward said. Oh, for crying out loud, Joan said. I thought you were supposed to be geniuses. She got up from the kitchen table, pushed her way past the Edwards between herself and the basement steps, and went downstairs. A few seconds later, Edwards began popping out of existence, one after the other, until there was only one left. Joan returned from the basement. What did you do? Edward asked her. I sent your time machine back in time so you couldn't use it in your misguided attempt to find the present, which I'm starting to believe never existed in the first place. Oh, I should have thought of that, Edward said. Yes, you should have, Joan agreed. But I swear, Edward added, I bought the electronics kit he wanted over at the scientific surplus store, and I sat at that very table this morning, wrapped it in blue paper with balloons on it, and stuck a purple bow on top. Uh-huh. Well, we're late now. Thank you for that, she said sarcastically. Where are the car keys? Edward put his hand in his pocket, but there was nothing there. I must have left them downstairs, he said as he started for the basement steps. I'll be right. Oh, no, we're not going through that again. Check your other pocket, Joan said. Edward froze in his tracks, 
slipped his other hand into the opposite pocket and pulled out his key ring. He smiled sheepishly. Let's go, Joan said. It'd be nice if we got there before he blows out the candles. She waited for Edward to open the door to the garage for her, then stepped out and waited again as he opened the passenger side of their old sedan for her to get in. Edward pushed the button that opened the garage door and crossed over to the driver's side and slid behind the wheel. He started the car, shifted into reverse, then swung his arm over behind Joan's seat so he could look behind him as he backed the car out of the garage. He went only a few inches before he hit the brake. What is it? Joan asked. Edward shifted the car back into park. Then he reached into the back seat and grabbed the gift wrap box sitting there. He presented it to Joan. Now I remember. I put it in the car so I wouldn't forget to take it with us. Joan took the gift and set it on her lap. Just drive, Edward. Just drive. Thank you for listening to The Time Traveler's Dilemma, written especially for the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's Fiction podcast by Rich Hosek. Please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, rate us on Apple, Spotify, and Audible, and share these stories with anyone who enjoys audiobooks. Speaking of audiobooks, the audio versions of my novels are currently available on this very podcast. If you're looking for other original story podcasts, check out asreadbyme.com. They have an eclectic mix of fiction, poetry, and essays that are sure to keep you entertained, all read by the authors. You can find out more about this podcast and the host of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs at richhosek.com. Thanks again, and all the very best. Don't forget to vote at the Podcast Awards. You can select Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs for both Best Fiction Podcast and Best Male Podcast Host. Visit podcastawards.com using the link in the description. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast app or Audible. And share these stories with anyone you know who likes audiobooks. You can find out more about the host of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs at richhosick.com. Thanks again, and all the very best.